Oh, Crossing family, it is so good to be with you. I wanna welcome those of you joining at all of our different locations, those of you watching online, and those of you who are part of our Crossing Inside family. I also wanna welcome those of you joining for the first time or the first time in a long time. We are so glad that you are here, and I hope that you guys will take advantage of the new here booth at all of our different lobbies. Uh, as a church, we exist to help people find, start, grow in an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Our desire is to make this region the hardest place on planet Earth for people to, to get to hell from. And in 2014, we opened our first campus uh, in Iowa in the town of Keokuk. This campus serves people from all three states, and this past Easter, they had a 1,000 people uh, attend on Easter, which is unbelievable for that church. For 10 years, there have been people from Fort Madison, Iowa. There have been people from Burlington, Iowa, there ha who have been traveling to this location to attend the crossing. And then in 2018, we started a location in Monmouth, Illinois. And since then, people from Burlington, Iowa, have been driving all the way to Monmouth, Illinois to attend that location. However, driving 30 to 45 minutes to find a church that prioritizes your spiritual development is not sustainable when it comes to trying to reach your family, your coworkers, and your neighbors for Jesus. And between Fort Madison, Iowa uh, on the south side and Burlington on the north side and West Burlington, there are 33,000 people in this corner of Southeast Iowa. That is the same population as what you have in Keokuk, Kirksville, and our Mount Sterling uh, communities. Situated 15 minutes, like perfectly situated, between Fort Madison and Burlington and West Burlington is a small town called Weaver, Iowa. And it's spelled horribly because Weaver is spelled W-E-V-E-R. And that's not how I would spell it if I was in charge. And maybe I'll change that one of these days in the future. Well, this past year, we have been hosting town hall meetings and preview services for the people of, in that region who've been attending one of our other locations. And the last preview service, there were 143 people in attendance at these little preview services once a month. Um, for context, uh, a church of 143 people would make it at least in the top 25 largest Christian churches in the entire state of Iowa. And in fact, uh, they also had two baptisms at the last preview service, and, which is unbelievable. And in the middle of all this, uh, we had a church that was kind of uh, on their last leg, and they reached out to us and said, we would like to give you uh, our building. Therefore, in service to our mission to help people find an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and in light of our unending commitment to make this region the hardest place on planet Earth to get to hell from, our elders at our most recent meeting decided that we will be launching our 12th crossing location in Weaver, Iowa. I can't wait. To those of you who call the crossing home and you're like, Jennifer and I, I want you to know, uh, you're, I know you're going, hey, we wanna be a part of this. There'll be plenty of places for you to make a difference. The building needs so much TLC and we will be leveraging part of our year end in your corner generosity initiative to facilitate many of these updates, and Jennifer and I will be the very first check that goes in, um, because I want everybody in Southeast Iowa to know that we are in your corner as you try to reach the people who are far from Jesus and bring them close to Jesus. To those of you who wanna leverage your gifts, talents, and abilities in service of helping to get that campus up and off the ground, uh, operate long-term, or you have a skill set like you're Liam Neeson when it comes to things, and you're going, hey, I wanna, I can fix this, I know how to do it, we will give you plenty of opportunities in service in preparing the facility. Uh, to those of you who are part of the Weaver campus, it's go time. Thank you for your patience, thank you for your participation, thank you for your prayers, and I'm telling you what, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell your mama, tell your baby mama, and your boss to pencil in an aggressive Christmas Eve launch. We're coming and we're coming fast. So, what I wanna do is I wanna pray for this location and I'm gonna jump into my sermon. Heavenly Father, I 
there's areas of this that feel like you've just opened the doors and it would be silly not to walk through it. And there are other areas that are gonna require radical faith. And God, we wanna honor you <clears throat> in both obedience and we wanna honor you in faith. God, we do not want to start this campus in pride. We wanna start this campus because we just want people to know you. And if you're in it, there's nothing that's gonna stop it. And so God, I pray that you would uh, be with us, be with the people who are gonna be a part of this journey, be with the people that are gonna attend this church. God, be with the people who are gonna see prayers answered that they never thought were gonna be answered. God, I pray that we would be a blessing to those communities and that it would be forever changed, not by us, oh my goodness, not by us, but by your spirit. In your name I pray, amen. I'm gonna put my professor hat on again and you're gonna have to hang on because this one's even more complicated than last week. But I think if you can hang on, and I mean this, if you can hang on, I think at the end of it, you're gonna see that God is just so stinking cool when he goes about doing stuff because he has hidden all of these incredible nuggets in chunks of scripture that you and I just don't really appreciate. But if you are a first century Christian and you had grown up in the trappings of the Old Testament, and you started seeing all the things that Jesus was gonna do in retrospect, your mind would have been blown. Because what we talked about last week is we talked about the tabernacle, about God's desire to get back in relationship and in proximity with his people. It was here through the law and through the sacrificial system, which we're gonna unpack next week, that people were able to temporarily be made right with God. That every time you messed up, there was a way for you in the short term to have a right relationship with God, but it was always temporary. It was never fixed. It was never once and for all solved. It was never completely handled. We learned that God eventually moved out of this tabernacle, which was a temporary place of worship, into the temple, which was a permanent place. And then on the heels of that, Jesus comes uh, to earth and Jesus is the temple. He is God in the presence, in proximity to his people. And when Jesus died, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. And what that meant is that you and I could now have access to God because God is holy and we are not, but God is making us holy. And there's no longer separation between us and God, but it got even better because not only was Jesus the temple, but check this out, we become a temple and he, we are a place where the spirit of God dwells. Let me recap that with Ephesians chapter two. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God doesn't just make a tabernacle and then make a temple and then send Jesus as a temple. Through Jesus, you and I become a temple, a place where the spirit of God dwells. But not only did God establish a temple, a place to dwell, he also established a priesthood. The priesthood was a group of people who would offer sacrifices on behalf of the general population. They were to represent God to the people and they were to represent the people before a holy God. They were mediators between God and man. They were a go-between representing both parties. And in charge of all of the priests, there was a high priest. He had, uh, there, all the priests were set apart. All of the priests were holy to the Lord. But then there was the chief priest, the high priest. And he was in charge of all the priests who were in service to God, who had been set apart. One of the ways that the high priest, oh, the high priest was kind of set apart in two ways. Not only did he oversee everybody, but he was set apart in what he wore and he was set apart in what he did. He had a very specific task. 
To set him apart, one of the things that was done is he was given a very special wardrobe, okay? Exodus chapter 28, I believe. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron. He's talking to Moses here, and Moses is gonna make Aaron the high priest, or God selects Moses to be the high priest, to give him dignity and honor. Remember those words, dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. These are the garments they are to make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, because uh, the priests had one outfit that was, had similarities, but the high priest had a very special outfit, and that's why they described it. And you might be going, hey, uh, this is one of the cool things. This is a throwaway thing. I love how God takes people who have a unique set of skills, gifts, talents, and abilities to do something that nobody else can do. The entire tabernacle was created with specialists. So if you're a quilter and you have ever taken flack from your family, I just want you to know God used people who were impeccable with a needle and thread and fabric to make the place that his people dwelled. He also used people that were gifted in art and stuff like that to actually make the garments that were used by the high priest. So if you have a unique set of skills, God acknowledges it and actually uses it in some of the very special places. Now, here is uh, an image of the high priest. And instead of dignity and honor, I want you to think glory and beauty. Those were the, those were the words that are probably a, a better version of the, of the translation. They were to look, and I know for you it doesn't look this way, but they were to look amazing. You have all these people walking around in earth tones out in the desert, and then you have this guy. If he walked by you, you would go, something is different. Now hear me, Aaron is not glorious and beautiful. What he's wearing is glorious and beautiful. We're gonna circle back to this. Now the first thing that he was to do is he was supposed to put on some white undergarments, which are basically to go from the, the Bible says, from the hip all the way to the thigh. So he wore basketball shorts. In other words, the high priest wore boxer briefs. And they were all white, completely white. Whitey tidies probably goes all the way back to the Old Testament law. You didn't know that, but whitey tidies are in Leviticus. Now, on top of this was a white linen coat. It was a gigantic robe, okay? And it had a checkered pattern in it that either made it look like squares or diamonds. It was just a big white robe. Now, on top of this, he was supposed to wear on his head a perfectly white turban or hat, which is just a white linen hat. And they were to make a plate of gold and they were to etch on the, pl on the plate of gold, holy to the Lord. This guy has been set apart as holy unto me. You might be going, Clayton, why are we starting out with all of this white? Well, uh, what does a bride wear on her wedding day? White, why? White symbolizes cleanliness, purity, the absence of evil or sin. The clothes that Aaron is wearing represent sinlessness. Aaron is not sinless. What he is wearing represents sinlessness. Now, on top of this, he was to put on a big robe. And this, was a, uh, this white linen coat was the robe of ephod. And it was a blue garment, handmade. And at the very bottom of it, it had like um, a version of a pomegranate. And then it had gold bells. And they were alternating all the way around. Why does this matter? When the priest was to walk around in the courtyard, you could hear him. Jingle, 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 jingle. You want to know why? Because everybody else, guess what noise they made when they were walking around? Absolutely nothing. Because this guy is completely different. Everything about him is to make you go, this guy is different than everybody else. And when he went into the holy place, not the most holy place, but when he went into the holy place, you'd hear him in there. Because nobody else could go in there. And you know what he'd be doing when he was in there? Jingle, 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 jingle. Every time he moved, you could 
hear him. He is completely set apart. Then he had an ephod. This was worn on top of the robe. It was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. And if you were paying attention uh, in last week or you read your Bible, these are the exact same colors that are inside the tabernacle, that are inside the temple. So in other words, he is wearing the same colors around the people that is found in the Holy of Holies and in the holy place. The high priest looks like the tabernacle. The high priest looks like the inside of the temple. What was hidden from all the people in the Holy of Holies is displayed to all of the people when he's walking around wearing the colors. It was made public through the high priest. Now, on top of his shoulders, there were these big gems, one on each shoulder, and they were made of onyx. And inscribed on these gems were, on one shoulder were six of the tribes of Israel, and on the other shoulder were six of the tribes of Israel. So he's wearing the people on his shoulders. And then these onyx gems are set in a gold setting. And then he was to put on a breast piece, or a chest piece, and on this chest piece were 12 more precious stones. And each stone was identified with one of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is very similar imagery to the 50 stars on the flag. Everything is designed to point you to something. So here's what you have. You have a man who is altogether different, completely set apart. He is wearing the colors of the tabernacle on his body and carrying on his body are the names of the people. He is glorious and he is beautiful and he is holy and he is adorned in purity. This is how God is setting up the high priest. And when all of this is done, you have one man to represent all people before God. He is a representative of all people to God. Now, that's his wardrobe. Now I wanna to talk to you quickly about his super important task, and then I'm gonna wrap it all up at the end, and you're gonna go, okay, now I'm tracking with you. One day a year, only one day a year, the high priest was to go in, and he was to go, he, he'd normally minister in the uh, holy place, but one day a year, he would go behind the curtain into the most holy place, and here, he was to atone for the sins of the people. He would go into the very presence of God. And on this day, he would offer a sacrifice and he would sprinkle the blood on the atonement cover, on the mercy seat from last week. And when that happened, for the, for the past year, the sins of the people were forgiven. He atoned for their sins. However, before he could do that, he had to take off all of his high priestly outer garments. And all he was able to wear in was the white turban, the white undergarments, and the white robe. He would take off all of his glory. He would take off all of his beauty. And he would show up as a normal man, wrapped, clothed, in purity and sinlessness. Now, as stated earlier, the high priest was in charge of all of the other high priests. So he was the, he was the CEO of Priest Inc. And when his priesthood was established, when he got the job, there was an ordination into the role. And when he was ordained into the ministry, so were the other Levites. They were all, the other priests were also brought into service of God on behalf of the people. And during the ceremony, both groups, both the high priest and the, the regular priests, went through the exact same things, but they went through them in different order. It's going to sound a little weird, but you, like I said, hang on. Aaron was washed in the lava. And then, after that, uh, 
his, the spirit, I mean, the, the oil was poured on him. He was anointed with oil, okay? After that happened, blood was applied to his right ear, his right thumb, and his right big toe, symbolizing that his whole body was now in service to God. Now, that was the order. It went washing, oil anointing, and then the blood is applied. But for the priest, the, regu- the, 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 the employees of the high priest, it was a different order. They were uh, washed, and then the blood was applied, and then they were anointed. So same things happened, but just in a different order. Now, some of you are way ahead of me, because as I talked about absolutely every single thing that the high priest wore and the high priest did, you were thinking, and if we've taught you anything here, you're going, I think we're talking about Jesus. And if you thought that, you would be 100% right. Look at John chapter one, verse 14, and we're gonna unpack how Jesus shows up in all of this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He tabernacled, he templed. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Like the high priest, Jesus is adorned in glory. But Jesus, uh, while the high priest wore white to symbolize purity and sinlessness, Jesus was pure and sinless. Let's keep going. Like the high priest who wears the names of his people on his shoulders and over his heart, Jesus carried our sins on the cross and has our names on his heart as he died on our behalf. Like the high priest who looks like the inside of the temple, Jesus is the temple who makes us into a temple of the living God. Like the high priest who represents us, uh, represents us before God, Jesus represents us before God. Like the high priest who makes a sacrifice on behalf of the people to cleanse them from their sins, Jesus made a sacrifice to cleanse us from our sins. Like the high priest who took off all of his glory and all of his beauty before he went in to the temple, to uh, to the Holy of Holies, to pay for all the sins of the people. And he takes off all of his glory and beauty and he is just wearing his white, which is his sinlessness and his purity, Jesus took off all of the glory of heaven and he shows up in human form as a sinless guy who goes in and reclaims his glory through the resurrection and ascension into heaven after he provided purification for the sins of the people. If you wanna unpack this in a really big way, when you go home, you can read the book of Hebrews, specifically chapter six and, or seven and eight, but let's just take a quick look at Hebrews chapter seven. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. Here, the author of Hebrews is talking about what is happening in the Old Testament versus what Jesus is doing for us today. Keep following with me. And we have a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. You and I have a better hope because we can now draw near to God where we used to not be able to draw near to God. Why? because Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. There have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy and blameless and pure and set apart from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Let me just pause here for a second. Jesus is able to completely save. There's a miniature devotional in here for you. I know that when you look at your soul, kind of like I look at mine, There are parts of your life that you've been honest about that you've said, yeah, I'm kind of screwed up there and I could use some help and Jesus, please help me. But there are probably some, some darker parts of your soul, some darker parts of your past that you're going, there's no way Jesus could ever love me through that. There is no way God could forgive me for that. There is no way that I could ever be made right 
I understand the promises that Clayton talks about that are revealed in scripture. They're so good for a lot of people, but there's no way that that could be good for me because of what I've done. Hear me, when Paul is writing about the priesthood of Jesus, he uses the word completely save. All the way through, whatever you turn over to him will be redeemed by him. There is no sin that has ever entered this world. There is no sin that has ever entered your life. There is no thought too dark that has entered your mind that cannot be completely saved by Jesus Christ in your approach to God. There is nothing, 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 nothing that you have ever done, thought, or considered that is not redeemed through the work of Jesus Christ. And if you wanna come to God, if you wanna have the hope of eternity and heaven in your heart, there is a way to experience it. And the way that you experience it is through the work of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is holy and blameless and pure and set apart from sinners and he is exalted above the heavens. Let's keep going. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. He doesn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because Jesus is, like, is unlike any other high priest because Jesus didn't have to offer sacrifices for himself because Jesus never sinned. So therefore, when he sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself, it is like your sins have already been forgiven in perpetuity because once and for all, he paid it all. He racked up a line of credit that your sin can never touch the balance. There's just too much there. There's too much power in the blood of Jesus. There's too much love in the sacrifice of Jesus. Now that should not motivate us to sin more. That should motivate us to sin less. This is why Paul writes about Jesus in this in 1 Timothy. For there is one God and one one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Hear me carefully. There is no one, look at your neighbor and say no one. No one who has the right or the authority to get in between you and your relationship with God. You have one mediator, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. Hear me, you don't need a pastor to get your relationship right with Jesus, or with God, you have Jesus. You don't need a bishop, because you don't need a bishop, because you have Jesus. You don't need a priest, because you don't need a priest, because you have Jesus, and Jesus is the high priest. You have all you need in Jesus. Now hear me, God gave all kinds of offices to the church, just like he gave all kinds of gifts, talents, and abilities to love and serve and lead the church. But when it comes to you getting in a right relationship with God, or you navigating the sins that are going on in your life, you have direct access to the Father through the great high priest, Jesus Christ, and anyone, who says that you have to go through them to get right with God is spitting on the work of Jesus Christ. A work that nobody else could ever do because there has never been anybody like him. Jesus is our one and only perfect mediator. He is our priest. Now stay with me. Remember the order of Aaron and the order of the other priests when they were ordained in the ministry? Watch what happens. Aaron was washed, then he was anointed, and then the blood was applied. But for the priests, pay attention now, they were washed, then the blood was applied, and then they were anointed. Now, if you're a bit of a nerd, uh, the Bible has a, uses a lot of imagery or typology to kind of preview that something is coming. And any time you see oil show up in the Old Testament, it is pointing towards the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Watch this. Jesus our great high priest. He shows up, and what order did everything happen in Jesus' life? 
Well, in Mark chapter one, Jesus was baptized. And then the spirit came down on him. He was anointed by a woman in Mark chapter 14. And then he was covered in his own blood on the cross, just like the high priest. But what about, what about Jesus' followers? Something crazy happens here too. We are washed in the waters of baptism. And when we are washed in the waters of baptism, the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives. And we are cleansed from all of our unrighteousness. And we are made holy before the Lord. And the Bible says after you repent <clears throat> and you're baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be anointed. You are baptized into Christ. The blood is applied and you receive the spirit of Christ. Do you know how great our high priest is? He's making us priests in service to God. He is taking people that you would never pick and saying, you can work for me in my house. He's taking people that everybody else would have written off. And he's saying, you can be in service to me. You can come into all the places that are off limits for a person like you, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. On Tuesday, I took my boys to hit a couple golf balls, and I was up there with a couple people from our church, and I just asked the guy a question. How much money would you have lost if, if someone would have bet you that your entire family would be coming to church five years ago? He said, quite a bit. And the guy next to him was like, I can't imagine how much money people would have lost betting that I would be coming to church. And I said, I can't imagine how many people in Fort Madison, Iowa would have lost money thinking that I'd ever be a pastor. That's how good our high priest is. He takes people that you, you've written yourself off because you know what you've done. And without you even knowing it, on your behalf, God was anointing you into the priesthood. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, that's the temple, to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You and I have the ability to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. He allows us to be a part of his redemptive work. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. There is not a single thing that you have faced that Jesus didn't face. Some of you have been waiting your whole life for somebody to understand you and the pain you go through. There's only one who knows exactly what it's like to go through what you're going through. It's Jesus. But the big difference between him and us is he went through everything that we went through, except he never sinned when he did it. Nobody here's raising their hand on that one. Like, yeah, I've managed all of it without sinning. That's not us. Jesus faced the same temptation, but when he faced it, he overcame it. Let's keep going. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with, you guys say this next word. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When you become aware of all the things that you've done, the last thing you feel like you can have is confidence before God. But our confidence does not come because of what we have done, our confidence comes. You see, we have access to a holy God through Jesus. Jesus understands our weakness, he understands our temptation, we can approach this God with confidence. 
not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Now check this. The Bible says that when we come into a right relationship with a God, we are clothed in Christ. He is our white garment. He is the one, we are not sinless. We are clothed in his sinlessness, which means that you and I have full access to all the grace and mercy we could ever need in our time of need. We titled this sermon series, Decisions in the Desert. So my question is, will you decide to make Jesus Christ your high priest? Will you decide to be a priest in service of God to help other people find him? Because we're moving to a time of decision. If you are here today or you are watching online, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you haven't started that intimate personal relationship that we talk about here at the crossing, you need a high priest. You need somebody to represent you before God. And it better not be you. And I want you to know when you're standing before God, uh, it's not gonna be your grandma. I'll talk to some people like, well, my, my, my grandma really loved the Lord. That's really awesome for her. But the only association that matters when you are standing before God is whether or not you are associated with his son. Now we can pass on the faith to future generations, but it has to be their faith. It's not ours. And if you're here today and you haven't started that relationship right now, you will stand before God on your own account on your own works, on your own record. And the only record that God will tolerate is absolute perfection. And the Bible is clear and your conscience is clear in that you know you have failed. And God knows it too. And so he sent his son, wrapped him in skin, to come and not only be a temple, but to make you a temple. Not just be a priest for you, but to make you into a priest for him. And so if you want, you can stand, not on your own account, not on your own record, but you can stand on the record of Jesus. You can be wrapped in his sinlessness. And if you're here today and you haven't started it, I gotta be honest with you. Why are you putting it off? Why are you trying to hold it back? You've probably been kicking this idea around for a really long time. And I'm not trying to pressure you to get it done today or tonight. I am trying to pressure you to start figuring out why you keep putting off the thing that God sent his son to die on behalf of you. Like why you keep putting that off. And I think we should at the very least start asking some questions. And if you're here and you're wanting to do that, in just a few moments, the people around you are gonna stand and sing and some people are gonna come to the steps and pray. And I wanna encourage you to walk right over there, underneath that screen, right next to the baptistry, or if you're watching online, I want you to type it in the chat and someone's gonna reach out to you. Now, to those of you who already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it says, because of what Jesus has done, we are to hold firmly to the faith. You're gonna be tempted to grab onto a lot of things right now. You're gonna be tempted to grab grab onto a party. You're gonna be tempted to grab onto some political issues. You're gonna be tempted to grab a hold of your family. And I just wanna tell you, encourage you, hold on to him, because he never fails. And he has done so much on our behalf that why would you wanna hold on to anything else? The second thing I'd tell you is that you have been made a priest, holy unto the Lord, set apart to represent God to the lost in our communities. God wants to use you in service of him to bring his lost children home. And we should carry that responsibility really, really well. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we need you. And God, you know every specific need, every hurt, every challenge, every hardship that's represented in this room and online and at all of our different locations.
God, we just want you to move in our hearts and our lives. We want you to bring about change that we could never make and change that we've been trying to manufacture, but God, you're the one who has the strength and the ability to bring it about. God, in the areas of our lives where we're prideful, oh God, I pray that you'd humble us. And God, in the areas where we've lost all confidence, I pray that you would lift us up. In your name I pray, amen.